Okay, it's 11 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started this morning. I'd like to thank everyone for joining us on this special Thursday edition of Updates. Um, I know that changes the messages up a little bit in terms of remembering to hop on, but we're glad that we have so many people on this morning. Um, our calls will resume next Friday, same time, same station as we have been. It'll be at 1030. And the registration for next Friday's webinar is already on uh, the website on the COVID-19 webpage. So if you want to go ahead and sign up for that, um, hop right at it. Also, a couple other things before I pass the torch. Um, as many of you have noticed, we've made a couple updates to the COVID-19 landing page. Um, that includes the Case Management County Status button and the addition of the testing information accordion. So if you haven't checked those out, please do. Um, know, and check those frequently because know that those will be updated. Um, and while we're still on a Tuesday, Thursday standing schedule for the end of the day email blast update, um, as we've mentioned previously, don't be surprised if you get one a different day of the week, um, just like you did yesterday, when there are things that we need to push out. Um, also pay close attention to those because if there's something that's really timely, it may not be COVID-19 related, but we'll include a notice there as well so you can get it as soon as possible. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Val. All right, thank you, Heike. Good morning, everybody. We're gonna start with budget this morning because that is what we uh, really are, the real reason we're having this call today, although we have other lots of questions that have come in that we'll wanna help get answered also. Uh, the first thing, and uh, so the governor um, on Tuesday at three o'clock announced what our expenditure restrictions were for the upcoming fiscal year. For the Department of Mental Health, that's a little over $15 million. That's a one five fifteen million. Um, from the Division of Developmental Disabilities, that's between eight and nine million dollars. And the biggest item on that list is our dollars, our general revenue dollars that got put in to help us address our wait list. Those are in expenditure restriction at this point. So we pushed a memo out yesterday, and there are some questions that we saw come come in on this, but um, there will be no slots for wait lists awarded this year. MoKid will continue as MoKid always has. MoKid's always operated on a wait list, so we will have turnover slots available for the MoKid waiver. Um, we will transition children's division folks to waivers that are supported by the division. Um, MoKids uh, that are terminating out of the MoKid waiver and need to move to another waiver will move to another waiver. Um, transition slots from nursing homes, those are federally required and will continue. No one else will be able to access waiver slots. So last year on the residential side, we did five slots a month. We will not be doing that at this point. So there are essentially no new waiver slots at this point. Um, Hopefully that will uh, get addressed uh, as we know more about revenues, as we know more about what the federal government will be doing. Um, nobody likes this, but this is where we're at today, July 1st. So to give you an idea of where our waitlist numbers are, because I thought you might be interested, as of Monday, we had 143 individuals on the residential or comprehensive waitlist. We have 777 individuals on our in-home wait list. 126 of those individuals score a 12. So that is where the wait list information stands today. The second thing that we got cut, or another thing that we got cut, I, this is just second because that's how I put it on my list. Um, there are two services that we will terminate out of our waiver. That termination will not take effect until March 1st of 2021. We have to go through an entire waiver amendment process to get those two services terminated out of our waiver. I'm going to end the suspense now and tell you the two services terminated out of our waiver will be the counseling service and the person-centered strategy services. Currently, we have 244 people utilizing those services. We will work to transition those people from those services to different services or alternative services as we can identify those but those two services will be terminated effective March 1st, 2021. They will also not be part of our waiver renewal, which we will talk about more later today. Um, so that's the second thing. Another thing that we got cut, it's a not quite $800,000 cut. We have eight counties right now that have some non-Medicaid agreements with the state still. Eight of those counties, all eight of those counties will see about a 25% reduction in their, um, 
agreements with the state at this point. And all of those counties have been notified of those reductions and we continue to talk through how those get implemented at the local level um, if we need to with folks. Also, we had a little over $300,000 in our budget that St. Charles County, along with the fact board in St. Charles County, used to help families navigate to the uh, system um, we've gotten a lot of really good results from that pilot project, but that pilot project right now um, is in expenditure restriction. Also, $250,000 that we um, work with WashU every year on tuberous sclerosis. Those dollars are in expenditure restriction. And there's also some regional office cuts, and we'll be working through those regional office cuts and HAB Center cuts at a local level. The bulk of those cuts, and when I say the bulk, I mean 92% of those cuts are related to E and E expenditures that we expect will not be as high because we do not have people in the office. We do not have people traveling the way they were traveling, those kind of things. So um, that is the, I just got a sticky note. How is, getting info? Um, how is the division getting information, read the wait list out to individuals on the wait list? So, uh, we're gonna, and hopefully we can rely on our TCM partners and our case managers to help us with this. We did post a memo out there that explains that. Uh, we will not be taking anybody off the wait list. So hopefully that point is made, but I do see the difference of people that were previously on the wait list not understanding that they're not moving anymore either, and that is accurate. They are not moving. What we have today, those numbers I gave you, 143 residential, 777 in-home, those are only gonna go up and those folks will remain on the wait list at this point. Okay, so good question. I'm glad you brought that up because I can see how there needs to be clarification between those two sides. Uh, next up is the fusion cell and I'm not gonna pull it up today because we've shown you this before, um, but the regional data, the Missouri Hospital Association posts regional data every Wednesday. That regional data is available to look at again. One of the things that I look at really closely on that regional data is the reproductive rate of the virus. That means if one person gets the virus, how many more people are they likely to spread it to? Um, the goal is to have a reproductive rate below one. Um, in Missouri, our reproductive rates in all the regions are hovering around one. Uh, with the exception of Northwest Missouri, that reproductive rate is about 0.6. What I can tell you is that for the last two weeks, those reproductive rates really have not changed a lot. They have stayed the same. So it's good not to see an increase. You always wanna see a decrease and hopefully um, us always talking about prevention will help us get there. Um, the other thing we wanna talk about is community testing. So community testing is continuing next week. They are wrapping up community testing for this week and for the 4th of July holiday. Uh, they did some major testing down in Southwest Missouri in McDonald, Jasper, and Newton counties. They're testing in Taney County. Um, we're still getting those results in. Um, then next week, there's testing in Cole County and Butler County. Want to make sure everybody understands that just because the testing is happening in Cole County and Butler County doesn't mean you have to be from Cole County or Butler County to get tested. Those are statewide community testing events. So if you're in Boone County and you want to drive to Cole County, the old lo local public health agency there, come on down and get tested. If you're in Camden County, come on up and get tested. I will tell you the Cole County event is scheduled for Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Tuesday is virtually full at this point, so if you wanna make an appointment, be planning on that being for Wednesday or Thursday. I think they were at about 25% full for Wednesday and Thursday for that Cole County event. But again, the events in Cole County, the impact is the entire state. If you're in uh, St. Louis, and you want to drive to Cole and get a test next Wednesday or Thursday, please, please feel free to do that. Um, but wear your mask while you're here, okay? <laughs> uh, second um, location is Butler County, and again, that is open to anybody in the state. The event is happening in Butler County. At this point, Butler County, all three days is only about 25% full. So I know we've shared messages with everybody. Please continue to push those messages out. You can push those out broadly. Send them to your churches to put in their bulletins. Send them to your community organizations to put in their newsletters. I mean, everybody can have that information. That information is not hidden at all. Um, and like I say, we always say on some of these things, we, we really don't care if you get it six or seven or eight times. The third thing I wanna talk about on the Fusion update is personal protective equipment. 
So um, Missouri is working with manufacturers across the state to um, actually manufacture personal protective equipment here in Missouri. We have a list of vendors in the state of Missouri and what they are uh, procuring. We will send that to Heike so that she can post that information so that you all as providers um, or any, anybody you know can get access to that information. I'm gonna try to find a link to it on the website so that you can keep it updated. But you can look through those providers. Those are Missouri companies that are making PPE. Um, we will continue to try to increase the number of Missouri companies that are making PPE. I can tell you right now, it, we don't have any Missouri companies making PPE, um, making PPE for gloves, because that's what we're really looking for right now. But there are gowns, there are surgical masks, there's hand sanitizer, there's face shields. Um, if you're an agency that's got some N95, you may want to go ahead and consider getting some face shields too, because there is likelihood that N95 shortage will continue and you will need to use a face shield and a surgical mask as an alternative or a cloth mask as an alternative to an N95. So as you're thinking about your PPE planning, I want you to be thinking in those kind of terms. Also, I want to give you an update on the number of positives we've got in the community right now. So this is positives of individuals that are in our waiver. Again, this is a really good number, but I, I, I want to caution a few things. One, we only have 63 positives so far since this started identified in the community that are in the waiver. I do want to share, though, that we are right now seeing about one new positive result for a resident a week a day, I mean, not a week, a day. So we are getting about one new resident positive a day at this point, or individual in the waiver a day at this point. So I just wanna make sure we really, really are still stressing screening our employees before they come to work, um, screening our individuals, monitoring symptoms, and uh, PPE usage, okay? Those three things are really, really important. We did get another question on the budget. It's about what about the money in the budget for rate rebasing? That actually was not even in the budget for the governor's consideration. That was cut in the House and the Senate version. So that didn't even get to the governor's desk for consideration. Um, okay, CARES Act, oh, testing update. I think I kind of covered that with the fusion update. So we will, uh, I will say there's a question in here on testing. So I wanna go ahead and bring that up front before I get into the other questions. Specifically, we have a, we have a lot of really good questions about the um, uh, re resumption of case management in-person outdoor activities. So uh, before we get to there, we have a question from our testing mailbox. That it is a hypothetical, which is good. You, we think in hypotheticals um, because you've got a plan. So say you have 13 staff that agreed to be tested and seven of those turn out to be positive and asymptomatic. So first of all, and I have done over probably 4,000 tests in the department, this scenario has never ever happened. And I've done them in really hot spots. I've done them early on whenever we had just started masking. So I, I'm not sure the likelihood of this scenario, but this scenario for us has not happened, one. So the second thing, if this scenario happens, there are other resources to get you support. Um, there's the DMAT, which is a state resource of healthcare type folks that can come in and help support individuals if you need it. Also, we have an emergency shelter group here at the department at the department level that we share with other departments. So as we run across providers that are struggling serving individuals, we work together to identify new service needs. So I wanna make sure you're aware of that. Third, we are very supportive of getting people moved around so that you can have adequate staff. And we will work with you to identify those things if that were to happen. I will tell you for us, and we have done a lot of testing, this has not been a realistic scenario for us yet. So um, while those people are quarantined, who's going to cover their shifts? So I kind of covered giving you some options there. If no one has shown any signs or symptoms and we have nobody with COVID, it seems like testing people could be a nightmare. I wanna tell you what my nightmare is. My nightmare is a positive resident and not knowing where it came from. And I've had that nightmare and it is not one you wanna live through because you don't know at that point when you've got a positive res resident and you're trying to find a hospital for them to go to and you can't, and you know that there is somebody back in that house that is pro possibly infecting your other residents, that's your nightmare. And that is what why we push what we've been pushing. Please remember, I have lived this as a provider since March 23rd. So 
we really, really, and we learn and do things differently every day because of what we learned the previous day. So please use us as your resource to help you understand and help us understand what you're experiencing. Um, we all learn this together, but some of us have had the opportunity to learn earlier. So take advantage of that. Um, okay, so that I wanted to put that in with the testing. Um, what else is on this list? Let's move on now to some questions around. So on July 1st, which was yesterday, we posted the list of counties where we do not want to resume in-person outdoor visits. So there's a list of counties posted where uh, visits will still, case monitor, case management visits will still remain remote only. All other counties are uh, all other counties that are not on that list, whether those are state case management or private case management, are expected at this point to resume in-person open air monitoring. And if that in-person open air monitoring cannot take place, then you need to document in the plan why that cannot take place. One of the tools we have given you to make that easier is the pre-planning document. That pre-planning document will help you as a support coordinator, as a support coordinator agency, as a support coordinator supervisor, make a decision if it is the right time to resume open air in-person monitoring for an individual. Also, if you live in a county and you are aware of information that you don't think we have and you want us to consider putting your county on the list as a county where it should still remain 100% remote visits at this point, then please let us know. Um, so I know one of the, I know uh, one sentence that we put out read, in-person activities may resume in any county not listed below. I am assuming, since it does not say must, shall, should, et cetera, that local decision making by TCMs will be allowed and honored if the primary contact is still through remote methods. Again, the answer to that question is yes, if you have documented through the pre-planning tool why that should be the case. I hesitate to say that you will identify that 100% of the time. So that is why that pre-planning tool is so important. And that is, we really, really need to resume those in-person outdoor visits in those counties that have not been identified. But the pre-planning tool helps you get to a point for each individual, okay? Um, another question or a point that we had, the hot summer temperatures make an outdoor meeting unrealistic if there's not shade at the family home or if they're unable or uninterested in meeting at a park or other outdoor location. Would it be accessible to document this in the case notes? Yes, but you need to be creative. So there's nothing that prevents you from doing an in-person visit with somebody through a window on a telephone, just like they do with nursing home visits right now across the state. You can totally do that. That would still count as an in-person visit, okay? So I want to encourage everybody to please, please, please be creative. Um, there was another question about Zoom because that was not mentioned as an example of a non-public facing product that could be used for meetings. Um, the response for this is we're looking to update the language in our documents to include Zoom. We know that it's currently for a variety of other purposes and that you must use password ID for the meeting and waiting room set up to view and approve participants. So just uh, keep that in mind. We'll work on getting that added. Um, another really great question. I have a few clients who live in RCF and receive day program services. These individuals know that the day program they attend started the services again the 1st of June. I've been asked when the rules will soften enough that they can leave their RCF setting and resume services. I was hoping you might have an idea of when RCF will be allowed to let residents resume services. So I know that the Department of Health and Senior Services and the Governor's Office continue to work on that long-term care facility reopening, re-engaging in the community, resuming activity guidance. They have put out the first two things on internal group dining, group activities, and on outdoor visits only. So um, I do expect that hopefully to come out within the next week and that will help support that question. Then I have some other questions on this other sheet. Um, regarding the memo for ISP planned, planning, monitoring, and review, is it accurate that service coordinators are required to move towards open air distance meetings? Yes, if you are not in a county listed on the website as remote only at this point. 
Some of my staff still are not comfortable in meeting with some families, individuals, even using the protocol below. I understand that open air distance meetings could be available now, but not that they were required for applicable counties. Can you clarify? So for those counties that it is remote only, they are not required. For everywhere else, they are required unless otherwise documented in the plan on why you did not complete that open air visit. Remote visits are still then required. We also wanna make sure you do as much work remotely as you can to limit the amount of time that you are with the individual, but making that face-to-face -face contact, having that conversation, that is really, really important. Then I gotta flip over. Um, regarding Appendix A, Guide for Pre-Planning Call, and I haven't actually fully read that yet, so Kim, I may have to pass this to you. Um, what is the purpose of an SC asking all of these specific questions if they are not passing along this information to someone in the division that would want to know if people are getting tested or not, if staff continue to work or not? I feel like these questions are above what a support coordinator would need to ask to simply assess whether they can safely meet with an individual family provider in person or not, like they are going to rec recognize work for the division but not reporting it to anyone. Can you elaborate on the questions, then? So there is no national best practice document on pre-planning before you start open air visits. So we are working on developing that. This is our first draft at it. If we find that something is, what I will tell you in this whole process of pre-planning or planning or trying to understand what you can or can't do, we've never taken questions off of anything. We have only added questions to something and redone it. So at this point, I think we're gonna stick with what we've got, but if we find that something really does seem to not be that necessary, we can revisit what that pre-planning document looks like. And yes, this is my status question of all, but I will answer it again, even though I did kind of already answer it. So no one will be getting any waiver funding in 2021 if they don't already have a waiver. No new request. That is correct. Um, and it's heartbreaking and I hate it, but um, it is the worst economic, uh, the last four months have been the worst economic four months in the history of our country. I mean, when you look at graphs compared to the Great Depression and the Great Recession, all of our numbers are way above those numbers in terms of unemployment, in terms of lost revenues to states, in terms of um, just overall economic impact. There is not a single indicator that is not skyrocketed above those two previous events. So hopefully things stabilize. Hopefully we can, can, we can get our cases down in Missouri and we can continue to reopen our economy, hopefully. Um, remember, COVID is a sticky little virus, and um, we don't know we don't know everything we need to know about it yet. But we do know things that seem to be working and seem to be successful and seem to be we're doing a really good job. And there's going to be I'm hopefully next week we'll have a document that I can show that uh, just kind of overall compares what we're doing in Missouri and specific situations to other states. So how we're testing in nursing homes and what our numbers are compared to other states who we're either impacted by this earlier than we were, which is a real reality, and so we were able to learn from them so that we didn't repeat those states. Same for correctional institutions, same for individuals with developmental disabilities. Our numbers are remarkably better than New York's numbers. Part of that's because we've not been impacted to the level of New York. Part of it's because we were able to learn from the things that they were doing in New York. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over. Wendy is on, so I'm gonna turn it over to Wendy at this point. All right, Wendy. Good morning, everybody. Just want to make sure that you can hear me because I am remote. Oh. Hello? We can hear you. Okay, we're going to okay. skip Wendy. Oh, oh, go ahead, Wendy. Okay. You're on. Go, so, okay. Wendy. Sorry, too many buttons for me to push. Um, okay, one one point of clarification I want to make. I had one of my team members texting me um, while we were talking earlier and just not as in the weeds of what we're doing as those in the field are. So just a point of correction that when you cannot do the monitoring visit, um, an in-person monitoring visit, 
then you're going to document that on your monthly support coordinator monitoring log. It does not have to be amended in the plan, but it will go in your monitoring log as to the reasons why that in-person open air visit cannot happen. So that's just the only point of clarification to, to people who actually are in the field doing that work. It's really important to the rest of us. It's like, seems like all the same thing. Um, okay, and I just have one quick thing to share and it's a success story. So I have the fun part of the presentation and Val carried the weight this week. Um, it's a, a testimonial on Station MD and want to thank Molly Jackson, Director of Service Coordination for Christian County for sharing it with us. She says, I want to share a success story from our county. This is such a great service. Yesterday, I used Station MD with Cooper. He has an outer ear infection from swimming. The service was amazing. Doctor was extremely nice. The process was simple, and I'm so thankful to have this service. It started out as a video call. He could see it made Cooper nervous. He asked if he could call me, and he called me immediately. He was very patient and explained exactly what to do. So thank you, Molly, for sharing that story. And we're so glad that Station MD is working out to be a really nice asset for everybody across the state. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to Angie. Okay, thank you, everyone. Um, just a reminder that we are still working on the waiver renewal for July 2021, and we plan to post that here in the over the early, end of this week, early next week. Um, the forums that we have, as a reminder again, we are going to have forums on July 21st and July 22nd. We're still um, figuring out the exact times, but I can tell you that on the 21st in the afternoon will be a forum for the service providers. The evening of the 21st will be a forum for individuals and families utilizing the waiver services. And then on the 22nd will be the forum for our TCM entities, all of our case management providers. Um, side note on something else, I'm so excited to tell everyone that our home and community-based federal rules, the statewide transition plan that we've been working on since 2014 June of 2014, we just received final approval from CMS this morning. So six years in the making, and I appreciate everyone's help and patience and working with us on that and all the transitions that the, that the providers have done, all the waiver settings. Um, guys did a great job, and we really appreciate the help on that. So you will see that posting come out soon, too, with that final approval. Yay. Congratulations, yeah. everybody. And that is system-wide yeah. that took a part in that effort. It is. It was huge. Okay, we're going to transition to Kim at this point. Hi. Good morning, everybody. Just real quick, um, a lot of information came out this week from the division. One of the important things that we posted was updated guidance from CDC. Um, I believe they updated it on June 25th. It speaks to the individuals that are at increased risk for severe illness related to COVID-19. One of the highlights of the updates was um, additional information regarding individuals that could be considered um, that might be at risk and that lists some additional underlying medical conditions. So please pay attention to that guidance as it's updated and as it comes out because it's really going to be crucial to support individuals as they're making those important decisions right now and individualized planning on what their activities should be like in their respective counties. And then also, we did have a question come in. It was a very specific question for an individual who had been tested. Can't emphasize and stress enough that those are individual um, cases and decisions, and so you need to consult with your primary health care provider as well as the local public health agency that you're working with in regards to um, your particular situations um, when, for example, you could return to work. And I'm going to turn it back over. Oh, he's ready already. Okay. Okay, sorry, I'm coming. I'm coming. <laughs> okay, taking my mask off so I can talk. Um, okay, so we got a couple more questions that came in. Another really good question. Thank you. Uh, current waivers and adjustments. So we've got individuals currently in waivers and they need care plan changes. Are we going to allow those to happen? Yes, we are. So what we we use our turnover slot stuff. So as people no longer access our waivers in Missouri, they uh, retire, graduate, pass away, whatever reason that is. We have historically used those those dollars to fund our care plan changes, and we will continue to do that at this point. So it is not the intent that we will not fund care plan changes at this point. Um, the next thing, um, oh. You know, I wrote it down and I don't know what that means now. Oh, 
Wendy, thank you. When I said ISP, I knew it was wrong, but I couldn't come up with the right term. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that feedback for everybody on the call. I just, my brain just went blank twice on that now. The third question that we had come in, and I think this is really the last one at this point. Mm -hmm. um, there is a question, because I know a lot of our TCM agencies do cover more than one county. And some of those may find that one of their county is in the remote only, but the other counties that they are in is not in remote only. They, they need to begin in-person outdoor visits in those counties that are not considered remote only. We do this for health and safety of the individuals that we support. That's why we do this function and to health and safety and to make sure that they're doing okay. They miss you too, so let's go see them, all right? Um, another question we had was, is the pre-planning tool, is that a guide? Can we develop our own? So technically it is a guide. I am not forcing you to use that pre-planning tool. However, um, and, and we don't have a ton of experience in pre-planning for case management, but we do have some experience in pre-planning for everything else. So um, you may want to vet any changes you want to do outside of that with us before you were to implement some pre-planning guide. And I saw another question come in on the Q&A. Who do we call if we think our county should be um, included in the counties that are um, remote only at this point? And you need to let, um, let's just have you go through Carrie Williams or your TCM TAC and let's work it up through that chain. It will get to us. So it will get to us at our level, but um, let's work it up through that chain, okay? Um, at this point, I think that's all we have. We had 436 people on the call again today, so I do appreciate the attendance on these calls. Um, I know a lot of people were anxious to hear about the budget. Um, while, oh, I did have one more question. This is uh, to our state employees only. There is a question, can you address staff concerns about DMH budget cuts resulting in elimination of full-time positions? There are... At this time, I have six positions in the Division of Developmental Disability that are slated for elimination. Our plan is to have that notification done by the end of next week. And like we did with the last elimination, we're trying to identify if there are alternative locations for those individuals to move to before we make that notification. So please just give me a little bit more time and we will we will make that known. But it is a very small number of people and I feel that we will be able to get most of those folks into other positions at this point if they are interested. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I will leave it at that. Um, I do not want anybody to have anxiety over the weekend about that, please. Anything stating mm -hmm. individual to have to test it if potentially exposed? No, um, that's gonna really, again, like Kim kind of addressed earlier, a county health department, so how we do it in our facilities is, and this is a provider decision, it could also come from a local public health agency. For us, we, we don't usually have to wait for the local public health agencies to come in and test somebody because we've already moved forward with the testing. But um, for us, if you are a contact of somebody who is positive and you live in one of my um, individual supported living arrangements or you live in a habilitation center, we are testing those residents. Um, I think for the most part, local public health would also want to require that you complete that testing, but you would be notified by them. Um, so, uh, but there's nothing specifically stating uh, if you're a contact, you have to be tested. You should wanna be tested and you should be calling us so we can help you figure out how to get that testing done. Yep. Angie. So we had a question come in about will waiver exceptions still be approved? And I would say, yes, those will still be approved because that's still based off of the identified mm -hmm. need. Oftentimes the waiver exceptions um, also require a reduction in another service or, or yeah, another service. So that should still be occurring. Yep. yep. Okay. Um, any, I think we're good. Thank you again for calling in. Um, please, please be safe this holiday weekend, both from the sparklers and from that sticky COVID. Um, wash your door handles, uh, stay outside, wear a mask. We were joking today on our call with our staff that, you know, if you're using sparklers, you should be six feet away from people. So let's just make sure we're all very careful, okay? Thank you for everything you continue to do. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for your support. And we will get through a budget crisis along with a pandemic and along with PPE shortages and everything else together. So thank you all. Have a good weekend.